Herzlich willkommen zu 99 zu 1. Welcome to 99, 99 zu 1. I will say it in German. Um, ein frohes neues Jahr allen. Ganz kurz auf Deutsch. Uh, das ist ja unsere erste Folge im neuen Jahr. Die fängt jetzt direkt auch einmal auf Englisch an. Deswegen switche ich jetzt ins Englische und bleibe dort auch. Aber die nächsten deutschen Folgen sind schon auf dem Weg. Wir haben ein tolles, ja, zumindest jetzt mal ein halbes Jahr durchgeplant fast. Um, das wird ziemlich spannend. Aber kommen wir direkt wieder zurück ins Englische. Today we have invited and are honored to host Michael Roberts. Welcome, Michael. Wow. Mike, uh, hi, Michael. Michael is the author of many books, um, but uh, also this book, and this is the thing that we want to talk about. You also see it there in the background. Actually, I'm going to maybe open it up a little bit like this and we see uh, handsome Michael a little bit better and uh, this is his book The Long Depression the subtitle you might not be able to read it it says how it happened why it happened and what happens next and this is exactly what we also try to talk about today let me give a short introduction to who Michael is whoever uh, to whoever to whomever Uh, is not already familiar with Michael. Michael uh, worked in the city of London as an economist for over 40 years. Uh, he has closely observed the machinations of global capitalism from within the dragon's den. Um, at the same time, he was a political activist in the labor movement for decades. And since retiring, he has written several books. Um, the first book um, that I don't have here now is The Great Recession, A Marxist View, that's from 2009, right after the beginning of the recession, actually. Then this book that I just showed, The Long Depression, also um, a book on Marxist 200 years, a review of Marxist economics. And uh, together with uh, Guglielmo Guglielmo <laughs> Carcedi? Yeah. Yes, correct. Um, uh, 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 editor of the book World in Crisis. He has published numerous papers in various academic and economic journals and articles in leftist publications. You are also the owner um, and the, well, the, the, the main writer in this blog that is called, can you give me the URL again? Wait. Yeah, it's the Michael Roberts blog. It's uh, the U URL is the next recession.wordpress.com. Next recession, exactly. Mm -hmm. And it's just me, nobody else. Uh, just you, just you, in fact, yeah. That's actually what... out everything every week. <laughs> right, let me write this down right here. Just one second. The next recession. Dot WordPress. Dot WordPress dot com. Mm -hmm. then, then I can display this right, right here on the display. WordPress dot com. There we go. And Of course, we're going to link that also in the description uh, down there. This is one, actually one of my favorite blogs. I've been reading that. I've actually only found it like half a year ago, but I'm trying to read backwards and you're producing a lot of content, so it's uh, it's difficult. But you basically um, try to tackle all kinds of topics um, from world economics. I mean, it may, may be about um, obviously the depression and the situation that we have around the current um, crisis around COVID and the inflation that we are seeing there, for example, talking also about um, climate change and the impact on the economy, also the, let's say, global responses of governments and how feasible they are, talking about China. Um, so it's a pretty extensive um, blog. It's always, but... always not even about economics, economic analysis. Exactly. Not the... not the viewpoint. So... Uh, if viewers are watching now, I'm not going to deal with political developments much. Um, you know, you prob they probably know more than me about that. Um, so it's really about the economic foundations of capitalism and how it's going. That's my contribution, I think, to the Marxist and socialist discussion in the movement. Right. Right. And uh, it, that's that's also the point that I wanted to mention. Most of it also grounded in Marxist economics. And that's, um, yeah, it's pretty rare. I mean, there are other people, of course, that do that. But um, to to yeah, to yeah to read a blog that is also as easily accessible as yours um, and, and get introduced into this world of Marxist economics, that's uh, really valuable. So thanks for that a lot. Um, but we are here to talk about um, the Long Depression, both the book and the actual depression. In your book, The Long Depression, you argue that the phase of global capitalism that we are currently in since 2008, 2009, so since that big crisis, uh, the financial crash, um, that this phase can be characterized as a crisis of capitalism, um, i.e. a depression, 
and in particular, we call it the long depression. So mm -hmm. before we go into some of these theoretical explanations, why it is that and why this crisis happened, uh, let's for maybe first get some str uh, terms straight for the people that are not familiar with this stuff. What's the difference between, let's say, a recession and a depression? And what characterizes a recession as a great recession, for example, because we also mm -hmm. had these. Um, what characterizes a depression as a great depression or a long depression? Can you can you bring in some order into these uh, terms for us, please? Yes, Nadia and the viewers. Well, well, a recession. The economists, not just socialist economists, use the word recession to describe a collapse in investment and production and employment. Uh, sometimes they call that a slump, an economic slump. And uh, these recessions, uh, it appears, if we go back to the beginnings of industrial capitalism, say to the early uh, 19th century, uh, started to become regular and recurring, perhaps every eight to 10 years, it varies a little. So you have a boom and then you have a slump or a recession as we call it, uh, and the collapse in the production, the people lose their jobs, incomes, investment collapses. That's the slump. That will perhaps last a year or two years. Right. And then we have another boom. So we have a cycle of boom and slump. Uh, and recessions then are part of that process it's up and down trough. Uh, in my book, The Long Depression, I try to identify something a little bit different, which doesn't happen on such a regular basis, which I call a depression. Now, actually, previously, economists, not just socialist economists, have, have talked about depressions. In the latter part of the 19th century, from about the middle of the uh, 1870s up until the early 1890s, in various countries, but across that 20 years, you could... We, you could have what we could describe as a depression. What's the difference between that and a recession? Well, a depression is where the economic growth and the employment and uh, wages and investment growth each year, and there's always usually a little bit of growth unless we're right in the slump, has, is very weak. It's much lower than in the previous period of, of relative boom. So everything is below the level of the original average. And interspersed with these depressions can be further recessions or the slumps that we've just talked about. And we can identify quite a long period of where you're in this very weak level of growth for capitalist uh, production. The first one was uh, the late 19th century, as I say, from the 1870s to the early 1890s, depending on varying countries. And then, of course, the one that probably most viewers do know about is what's called the Great Depression of the 1930s, when... Uh, right. The stock market collapsed in the United States, and then the United States economy, the biggest economy in the world by then, went down a deep, deep hole and stayed down there with massive unemployment and bankruptcies and uh, people jumping off buildings, committing suicide and all the rest of it. Uh, a shocking situation of poverty developed right from the 1929 up until the beginning of the Second World War. So the Depression didn't go away. And that's a long period. There are little recoveries and then slump again. So there's there's a second uh, depression. The third one is, in my opinion, what we're in now, that from, as you say, from the end of the Great Recession, which perhaps we can discuss in a moment, uh, we've had a very weak level of recovery from 2009. Growth is much lower uh, in all countries compared to before 2009. Uh, employment, although uh, has increased in many countries to the level of reducing unemployment, it's very poor unemployment. Wages right. have been held down. In fact, right. real wages, that's wages after inflation, have been flat for 20 years in many countries. So right. this is a depressed period. And so I, my argument is that we can identify these particular depressions as being different from the recessions which might appear within them. And that's important because it gives us an indication of the state of the capitalist economy, what direction it's going on, and so if those of us active in the labor movement can judge better uh, the prospects for uh, changing that situation. So there is a difference between depressions and recessions. Most uh, economists would probably not notice that too much. There are a few like me who agree with that. But on the whole, uh, whether they're orthodox uh, economists that support the capitalist system or whether they're radical economists who don't, uh, this distinction is not really made. So that's partly why I wrote this book, Great. Depression, because I wanted to bring out this distinction. 
So, so it, it, would you agree? Like, if I try to summarize this, that it's basically about the nature of the recovery um, of 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 the dip, basically. So you you might you might have this kind of V-shaped curve yeah. where, where you know it drops and then it comes back up, right? Yeah. And maybe even continues higher than yeah. it was before. Yeah. Now now you have the situation where it drops and then it also comes back up, but very 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 slowly and maybe even never reaches uh, even the levels just before the. Um, that dip again and that would be then more what you would call a depression correct yeah that's what in the book i do a little schematic diagram which shows exactly what you described nadine and right. so you could call i used to call the depression a reverse square root so if you if you've yes. got any arithmetic left in your brain uh, <laughs> it goes the, the opposite way but it doesn't recover to the previous trend level or at least not for a long time if at all as you say and that's different from the normal as you can call it under capitalism of boom and slump down, then back up again, and perhaps the trend then continues or even higher, exactly as you said. But right. I have a diagram in the book which helps the view yep. uh, readers follow that closely. Absolutely. Um, so, as this is a fairly regular phenomenon, let's maybe not the depressions, but the recessions at least itself mm -hmm. themselves, and even the depressions are now something that we can um, yeah, see are happening repeatedly over history. Mm -hmm. There should be some kind of answer from mainstream economics or maybe even from some kind of alternative um, economics on why those happen. So let's not go immediately to Marx because obviously he has a crisis theory um, and we're going to talk a lot about this. But what do they, what do the neoclassicals, the, the Keynesians, maybe the Austrian school, the neoliberal school, what do they say about these crises? Why, why do well, they happen and what do they do about them? So. Uh, what are mainstream economics, which has various wings that you've just mentioned, what do they think about this uh, situation of booms and slumps and regular and recurring sessions? Well, some of them say uh, there aren't any. They, or if they happen, it's not a regular and recurring process that we can look for uh, an understanding or an analysis of. It's just by chance. Sometimes, for some reason, uh, capitalist production collapses. Uh, it could be one reason. It could be for a stock market collapse, it could be a housing collapse, it could be oil prices shoot up. There's lots of different chance reasons. Uh, you could say the COVID uh, global crisis is another one. Uh, and that's why we get these slumps. Otherwise, according to these, this particular approach, is that capitalism moves harmoniously upwards and steadily. And there's not really a problem, but you can't deal with everything. Sometimes there's a crash. Uh, at the other extreme, you've got what you might ask Austrian school of economics. That's a group of economists in the early uh, 20th century who uh, were very strong free market people. They believed that the market was the way forward, that socialism and planning was a disaster, and that capitalism should be allowed to progress just as it feels. But they recognized, actually, that they're what they call business cycles. So there were booms, and then there were slumps, and then there were booms again. And some of them say, well, this is just a natural breathing in and out of capitalism, we can't change that. And you shouldn't change it because if you interfere with it, like governments try to do by uh, uh, reducing interest rates or central banks boosting money or government spending, government spending to try and ameliorate this boom and slump, you just make the situation worse. So that, there's that school. And then there's the, perhaps the majority school um, within the mainstream, which argues, well, yes, uh, there is... There are recessions. How can anybody deny what happened in 2008-9 as being a huge recession? We're not sure that they're regular and recurring, although right. actually they publish the evidence to show that they are. Hmm. Uh, and the reason for the, the these slumps is manifold. It's different each time. It could be, as I say, not just these little incidents in history, but also it might be due to uh, not enough spending uh, available for workers to spend to keep the economy going, or it could be due to f financial instability, greedy bankers taking the economy down, various other reasons. None of those reasons, in my view, work as an explanation. And I just say why they don't work, because they do not explain what is clearly a fact about recessions and booms, that there is a cycle of boom and slump, and it's on regular and recurring basis of about eight to ten years, and it can be measured as such. But no right. mainstream view uh, has an explanation for this. They cannot right. provide that. Yeah, and that's, I mean, um, uh, <clears throat> having read 
a little bit of Marx and knowing also uh, of his contentions with political economy of his time. But that's um, uh, that's if you if you contemplate this idea that we have now 100, uh, let's say 150 years of experience and data that actually shows the periodical nature of these kind of crises and still not coming up with a theory to actually um, explain them. Uh, is is remarkable. <laughs> it's uh, it's quite interesting. Well, it's ideological, I would say, Ned, in that uh, right. well, those who are supporting the current system as the perfect system, there can't be anything better than the market economy with capitalists employing us all to go to work for profit. Uh, we have to defend that system, and we can't really talk too much about the serious uh, fault lines that exist in this uh, capitalist system. So on the whole, right. we'll either ignore it or come up with something that's not to do with capitalism's own in contradictions right then then let's come to the marxist explanation of of the crisis ridden nature of capitalism um we in our last episodes i try to give a little bit of an intro for our german-speaking audience as to what the tendency or the the law of the tendency of the rate of profit to fall is at least how marx um constitutes it and how this law is actually behind those regular crises but um let's 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 suppose i didn't do that and maybe you can as, as short as long as you want try to explain what this law is and how it explains these um, recurring crises that we're witnessing well let me first say that um even amongst the marxist economists and the socialist economists there are differing views on the nature of crises under capitalism where we all agree is there are regular recurring crises under capitalism but mm -hmm. a lot of Marxists do not follow this particular uh, explanation, which is found in Marx's Capital, his most major work, in his what eventually became Volume Three, and that is the law of the tendency of the rate of profit to fall. What does that mean? Well, uh, what Marx said was, and this is the simple thing that all viewers must take in, because I start really from this point of view: that what is the capitalist mode of production? The capitalist mode of production is that individual owners of industries, companies, and so on, they own them, you don't, you work for them. There are two classes, main classes, if you like, the owners of capital, the owners of the means of production, as Marx would call it, and the rest of us who don't own the means of production, who have to sell our labor, our labor time, to the capitalists in order to make a living. And the capitalists use our labor to produce goods on the market for a profit. They don't go to produce things that society needs, although obviously they have to be needed, otherwise they wouldn't be sold. But they don't produce things, capitalists don't produce things in order to meet society's needs. They produce them for profit. This is a profit. I mean, that's very important because it means the more uh, profit that the capitalists make, the healthier they feel, the better off they are, the more they're prepared to invest and employ more workers because they're making more and more profit. Uh, so that's how the system works. So therefore, the health of the capitalist system depends on what's happening to profits. That's a key point, because a lot of right. other don't even consider profits as being relevant to what's right. going on. But it seems to me the most important thing about the capitalist economy. Right. And what volume three of Capital, Marx describes a law where he says, as capitalists invest more and more to look for more profits, they actually... A yeah, situation develops where the rate of profit, that's the amount of profit they're making on their investment, not the mass of profit, not the total profit, but the amount they're making on each investment and the total amount of investments they've made begins to fall. Why right. does it begin to fall? Uh, and uh, what does that mean if it does begin to fall? It falls, says Marx in volume three, because capitalists are competing against each other to get more profit out of their workers they're trying to squeeze the profit out of the workers. The best way to do that, eventually, they can they run out of hours they can make workers work, and they may even run out of workers. What they need, therefore, is to increase the productivity of workers so they employ machinery uh, that can increase the productivity of the labor force and also reduce their costs of production because they can lay off workers and just use more right. machines. And so the most efficient capitalist is outbidding the other capitalists by having the best technology. So there's a drive to raise profit. But what Marx shows is everybody tries, every capitalist tries to pitch in and get this new technology, lay off more workers. But as they lay off more workers relative to what they're spending on machinery, they actually reduce the amount of profit they're going to make 
uh, as the pro as the production takes place because this is another key point that Marx makes. Profit is only coming from the exploitation of workers. Think about it, viewers. If you none of us go to work, there is no commodities. There is no profit for the capitalists. Uh, we're not in a position where robots make robots or make robots and produce commodities yet. If we ever get there, we're in a position where we have capitalists have to put workers like us to work in order to get a profit. But if they reduce the amount of workers they've got relative to the amount that they're investing in machinery and technology in general, then there will be a tendency for each in increase in investment that they make, total cost, to be reducing the actual amount of profit as they progress. So there's a tendency for that profit to fall over time. And if the, the cycle of crises and boom and slump therefore comes about as capitalists compete and the, the profit rate begins to debt fall, it could reach a point where the total amount of profit being made by capitalists actually falls. And when it absolutely falls or gets close to doing it, that's when capitalists stop investing. If right. you're a capitalist and uh, you're going to invest another 100 million next year and you find that actually if you invest 100 million, you actually lose money or you get even less than you expected, that's the rate, but you start losing money, then you're going to stop making that investment. And you can say, I don't want to do this anymore. I'm, it's not worth it. I'm not making a profit. Even if the rest of us need these things and we all need work, they're going to stop. So that's how the slump begins. But of course, when the slump takes place, a lot of capitalists lose their businesses as well. They collapse. The stronger capitalists take over their uh, industries or merge them up or uh, reduce their late workforce and make them sweat a bit more. And mm -hmm. then you get a rise again in the profit rate for a while and then you get a boom. So we have a cycle like this, and it's all based on what's happening to the profitability of capital, on average, across the whole economy. When we read in the newspapers and uh, in, on the media that huge profits are being made by the likes of Apple, Netflix, Amazon, and so on, massive profits, uh, viewers must remember that these are a small number of com companies, very small number of companies. And overall, the average rate of profit for American companies and British companies and German companies uh, will tend to fall. There are periods when it rises, and we can discuss why, but they tend to fall. So the profitability across the board is actually low. At the moment, it's probably the lowest it's been for 60 years, despite right. the fact that the Amazon makes trillions and trillions. Those are the, uh, so that's the, the explanation of uh, at least uh, the Marxist explanation for crises and booms and slumps based on this law of profitability. I, again, just finished the Nadim to say that a lot of Marxists don't agree that that is the main explanation of capitalism, uh, capitalist crisis, but I think it is, and therefore we could perhaps debate later on other theories that come from Marxists. There, there is an also quite some, um, yeah, uh, empirical evidence actually to show that this law seems to operate um but we, we will come to this in a second i just want to give one comment regarding that argument um oh but there are so many companies making profits and amazon you know amazon uh, had a huge boom now over the last crisis during COVID, etc mm -hmm. um so the fall of the rate of profit does yeah. not imply immediately that the mass of profit falls um so it might very well be that amazon becomes crazy rich, but their profit rates still drop. That yep. can happen right. because they're still making profits. I mean, they're not in the negative yet, let's say, right. in the negative rate yet. So that's that's also one thing that I heard many, many times um, in arguments with people that are not so familiar uh, about this law to argue about, you know, but look at how all these companies are getting rich, Uber and Google and Facebook. And uh, of course, on top of the argument that you made that the economy is much bigger than that, and we're talking about national economy, we're not talking about one company or two companies or even 10 companies, but the whole of the economy. Um, uh, and uh, as you say, there, there is a, uh, Marx makes clear in volume three, there's a difference between exactly as you say, the rate of profit, that's the what return you're getting on your total investment as a ratio, and the mass of profit, the amount of profits you're making in total. And as you exactly say, the rate could be falling while the mass is uh, rising. And that's a situation right. I, I would put to you at the moment on the question of COVID and Omicron. Uh, people are telling yeah. us that Omicron has a lower death rate and a lower illness rate. Uh, but because it's so infection, infectious, it has a huge mass of increase. 
So even though the rate is falling, you can get a very high level of people ending up in hospital. Yeah, exactly. The difference between rate and mass. Eventually, of course, if the rate falls so much, it will drive down the mass, and then you will get uh, the slump that uh, we've talked about. Yeah, well, I'm, I mean, as a capitalist, I might even become hesitant to invest before that, right? So I might, I might think for, I don't know, the rate of profit, let's let it be, I don't know, 2%, very mm -hmm. low. I might say, ah, that's not that's not lucrative enough for me. I'm not going to invest that. Maybe I'm going to hoard the money. Maybe I'm going to put it into the, I don't know, fin financial market stocks, et cetera, yeah. and not in the productive economy. And um, so I'm doing other things with that money. And so it doesn't flow back into the economy. So, um, so empirically, it seems clear that and you also alluded a little bit to this but let's go, go a little bit into those counter, counter tendencies that, that marx describes because the law of profit does not always fall that's why he's also talking about the tendency and you show this also in your book that there are these kind of um, spikes and deviations with a tendency downward um for very i mean for various different um countries even uh, on aggregate over certain countries or, or over the whole world even um so how does marx explain these deviations in, in the rate of the profit. Well, as you say, Nadim, if you uh, if viewers go and readers go and read the book Long Depression, and also if they go on my blog, I give lots of evidence, empirical evidence to show how this law is operating. And as you say, there's a long-term tendency for profitability to fall. So the law of the tendency of the rate of profit is validated by the evidence. There is a falling rate of profit over the long term. But you can have periods when the rate of profit can rise in a country or even globally for quite some time, two decades maybe. Uh, and so what is the reason for that before the, the long-term tendency applies again? Well, Marx describes in Volume Through Capital um, uh, the tendency, and that we've discussed the tendency for the rate of profit to fall, and that's the dominant feature of the capitalist production and investment process. But there can be periods when the, there are counter tendencies as a result of that, one of the basic counter tendencies, if the capitalists are investing more in machinery and technology, and that's starting to drive down the rate of profit, they can try and counteract that by exploiting us harder, by trying to raise what Marx calls the rate of surplus value, how much extra, how much profit they get out of us for the wage, wages they pay us. So they try to raise the rate of exploitation. Uh, they can do that by making us work longer hours or more intensively. Uh, so if we're all working at home now, uh, we're no yeah. longer working just six hours a day if we're lucky or eight hours a day. Uh, we're sitting here on 10, 12, 14 hours a day because we're in front of this screen uh, as long as the babies are not interrupting us. And so there is an intensity of uh, exploitation. That's one counteracting factor. Uh, if you'd like, uh, and other factors are like um, if a huge slump takes place in the economy, uh, then all the weaker a capitalist companies start to go bust, all the workers get laid off. So there's a massive reduction in the costs of production because there's less workers being uh, employed and there's less uh, capitalists uh, competing with each other. So the surviving capitalists get a boost in the rate of profit. So actually slumps are a big counteracting factor to this long-term tendency for a falling rate of profit. So a slump can boost uh, that as well. Also, maybe you can expand into new markets around the world. We used to call it globalization, where capital expands into areas which really haven't been developed on a capitalist basis much yet. And you can employ huge amounts of labor in China, India, Africa, around the world at cheap rates. And you can use the latest technology to really get a boost in profitability, in exporting all that back into the a more advanced economy. So globalization is another counteracting factor right. and, and has been. And privatization. Let's uh, let's get rid of some of these state companies, state industries, uh, and turn them into profitable companies in the private sector. Let's cut back on government spending on welfare and so on, reduce the costs of taxation to the uh, capitalist companies. Uh, all these are methods of counteracting this tendency to fall. And sometimes that can be dominant for a whole period. Uh, the period which we now call the neoliberal period, which means a period when the capitalism could do what it liked, if you like, and there was no regulation, no state interference, no high taxation. The period from about the early 1980s up to the end of the 20th century was such a period when the rate of profit on the whole in most countries rose. 
uh, it was not falling. But if you look at the whole of the 20th century, there was a general long term fall. Yeah, that's um, and that's also that one thing that is really stunning to me because of the the overwhelming empirical evidence to show that. I mean, from all kinds of different uh, perspectives, like page after page in your book is basically going through all of that. So it will be interesting to talk in a second about why uh, other Marxists are refuting this and, and what other um, theories they have. But before we go there, I, I, have, I have maybe a stupid question because that's actually also coming again from a discussion I had with a friend. Mm -hmm. The uh, Marxist argument, if I, if I understand this now correctly, is that it's profitability which motivates investment. Um, yeah, you, you go in your book, you go to great lengths to prove that there are correlations between rates of profits and the level levels of capital investment. So you actually show that if, if the rate of profit is low, there is low investment happening. Um, or investment is held back by the capitalist. This is a macro macroeconomic view, I would call that, um, because it looks at the whole economy in an aggregate. But wouldn't that also mean that somehow the individual capitalists, that was the question that I was um, posed mm -hmm. to, um, the individual capitalist corporations, which normally, you know, they work for themselves, they are private entities that are uh, interested in um, their private uh, profits that they would need somehow information on what's going to be the rate of profit in the future or how it's actually developing um, in order to make that call to withhold the investment because if I'm looking at the situation right now I cannot I cannot really say what the return of my investment will be in a year or in five years from now right so what's what's the how would you explain this to a complete newbie to this topic well the first thing to note is that uh, from the point of view of the individual capitalist, it's an individual situation. That owner of means production, say in pharmaceuticals, a pharmaceutical company or in a media right. company, so was looking at the situation in their sector and they're competing with other companies mm -hmm. to get them the maximum profit they can get out and to get the biggest share of that market's profits. So they're competing against each other. They're not thinking about the overall average. Market. Right. They're trying to gain market share and profit share from the other capitalists and to maximize the exploitation of their own workforce uh, to increase that and to undercut everybody else. So their drive is towards the individual profit. And Marx actually discusses in Volume 3 of Capital, and that's exactly what capitalists do. They'll go on investing because they're expecting uh, to make more profit by investing in new technology and sales. So why would a capitalist invest in new technology if they didn't think they were only going to get a higher profit? Um, that's what Marx says. They, uh, they wouldn't voluntarily refuse to invest if they right. knew they were going to get a higher profit. So they start with the idea of getting a higher profit. But as we see, if everybody pitches in with the new technology in that sector and across the economy, then there's a tendency for the uh, amount of investment taking place in machinery and technology to outstrip the investment being made in the workforce for to wages. And as the workforce is the only force that can actually deliver the profit when it comes to it, if they spend more and more on technology to compete with each other, overall, the result is that the profit relative to the total investment by everybody starts to fall. So although mm. everybody's expecting an individual increase in their profit rate, in their company, overall, uh, behind their backs, if you like, without their control, that profitability begins to fall. This is the paradox of, uh, of the capitalist uh, process of accumulation. Um, Keynes, that's a mainstream economist, used to call it the paradox of thrift. If everybody uh, thought that they saved money uh, at home or in their businesses uh, and, and hoarded it, uh, they would have more money. But of course, if everybody does that, the right. result is nothing is being spent, and so everybody goes down. Uh, this is the paradox of profit, if you like, that each capitalist is competing, driving themselves forward to get more profit, but in doing the way it's doing so, the, these individual capitalists is actually lowering the overall rate of profit eventually, not immediately. Uh, there can be periods when it expands. And so that's the contradiction. Uh, so that's why the capitalists don't realize, if you like, it's behind their backs. Then they find after they made their year's investment, that the profit rate, they're getting less profit relative right. to the investment. Right. They, do, they don't know why, because they've been doing their best to kick it forward, but that's because of the impact of every sector and every capitalist in the system. So that's the paradox which exists in the process of capitalist accumulation, which is the contradiction 
that to Marx reveals between the attempt to increase production and at the same time increase profit. Profit and production come into contradiction under capitalism eventually. Excellent. Thanks for that answer. I know what to say now. Um, I'm <laughs> there is a, uh, that's the paradox of profit, I call it. It's not, I don't think Marx uses that word, but it's in there if you want to read yeah. volume three, and I describe yeah. it in some of my works. Yeah, yeah. So let's talk about those other Marxists, and this will be the last question on the theory. Then we go a little bit into the into the history and the actual depressions that we witnessed in the past. Um, so, how do other Marxists explain? Like they they have a tendency. Actually, most Marxists that I know of, um, that I read of, uh, Harvey, Panitch, um, uh, uh, I, not Kleiman, I think Kleiman tried to restore yeah. the uh, rate of profit. Um, yeah, but m most Marxist economists. Um, it actually refute, um, if not even uh, the the law of value itself, but at least the law yeah. of profitability. So, and then, then they start talking about, you know, the crisis still happened. They talk, start talking about overcapacity, for example, yeah. or as uh, talk about debt, over indebtedness. Mm -hmm. um, why do you think, or if you were to reproduce the argument, um, against the rate of profit? Why do you think they are refuting this? And um, how are their explanation of crises contradictory or not contradictory to what the law of profit tells us? Well, the first thing to say, that although uh, Marx's uh, law of the fancy rate of profit uh, uh, to fall appears in volume three of Capital, historically, that volume three was not available to socialists right. and Marxists in the late, right. until the late 1890s, if it was read. So uh, the majority of activists in the labor movement and the social democracy in Germany and so on, with social democracy in Germany in the late 19th century was the most important uh, uh, movement for socialism in the world. And it had the, the most top theoretical leaders like Karl Kautsky, Babel and, and others. Uh, and those, those people, didn't really t take into account uh, what Marx was saying in volume three of Capital. So what was their theory? Well, historically, their theory was quite a simple one, and it sounds convincing. They say, look, the capitalists exploit the workers and they hold their wages down. Because they hold their wages down, the workers can't buy all the goods that the capitalists are selling on the market because their wages are too low. So as workers can't buy back all the goods that are being produced, in an economy, there is an underconsumption crisis. There's mm -hmm. not enough consumption, not enough spending, and capitalism goes into crisis because it can't sell all its goods. That's probably the key alternative uh, view. We've had variations on that in the 20th century. We're saying that the cap, uh, because the workers can't buy all the goods, uh, because their wages are reduced, they borrow lots of money to get their houses or their or to spend money, the consumer credit and so on, they build up. There's a huge amount of debt builds up, and that debt gets too much for workers and even capitalists to uh, service, to pay the interest on or repay, and then you get a debt crisis and the economy collapses. So these arguments are, it's nothing to do with profit. On right. the contrary, is to do with spending right. and the debt that you incur in trying to spend more and keep uh, the system going. But what are my criticisms of that? Well, first of all, I don't think Marx would agree. And that's not a, a, a sufficient criticism, just because one guy reckons he doesn't agree with it. But Marx uh, did not consider underconsumption or the lack of spending as the reason for crises. In fact, he's often argued at points that it's when wages rise that you get a slump because it starts to squeeze profits. Mm -hmm. and then the capitalists are forced to lay off workers and so on. Uh, so... It's not a lack of wages or underconsumption that uh, causes crap. In in a way, work there's always underconsumption. Workers never have enough wages to meet the, the requirements yeah. that they want. Yeah. And anyway, it's also not true that the only people who spend money in the economy are workers. Who else spends money? Big money. Other capitalists. Capitalists buy goods from capitalists. So there's a lot of demand from capitalists buying other goods. You may buy uh, that microphone you're looking at now. But somewhere down the road, there are lots of capitalists who've made all kinds of components of that. Parts and, the here, yeah. and the microphone uh, capitalist has been buying these components. So there's a huge amount of capitalist demand. And that's why the capitalist system progresses, even if workers have got a low wages. What decides the collapse 
is what we were discussing before, the change in the profitability of doing uh, that process. But on the whole, that view didn't dominate or have much strength uh, in the early uh, socialist movement of the late 19th century and into the early 20th century. And really, uh, the view of what Marx wrote in Volume 3 of Capital about the tendency of Enterprise 4 has remained a minority view, surprisingly, although Marx yes. wrote it. Uh, and right. that, um, there's a very small number of, of Marxist economists who offer that theory. The majority view, as you say, is that they look for other explanations for crises. It could be debt, it could be this lack of wages, uh, or there is no theory of crisis. Right. Uh, Michael Heinrich is a prominent uh, German Marxist economist and a scholar of Marx. We had him on our channel, by the way. Yeah, yeah. and yeah. He, uh, uh, he would say that Marx didn't have a theory of crisis. Mm -hmm. that it, it fa um, yes, there is the law of the tendency rate of property to fall in volume three. But frankly, that law doesn't work. I've never quite understood why he says that. But he basically says that it doesn't work because actually there's no reason to assume that there is a tendency for the fall rate in profit. It could go up, it could go down. And Marx's explanation of why it would have the downward, downward pressure is not convincing, he would view. And he would then go on to say that actually Marx recognized this uh, in his last decade of life in the 1870s. According to Heinrich, who's an expert scholar of, uh, yeah. of Marx's works, he says, if you read Marx's works, I can interpret the fact that Marx actually dropped the theory and didn't believe it anymore, and didn't have any theory of crisis. I've strongly uh, rejected that view. I may not be a huge scholar like Michael, uh, the other Michael, but I, I, if you analyse what other writers have said, and if you look at Marx's works, there is no evidence to say that he dropped this law as, a, as an explanation of crisis. No, no evidence. It's just an interpretation by Michael Heinrich, but it's not, in my view, convincing. And more than that, there is no empirical evidence uh, uh, that uh, opposes that theory. In fact, quite the contrary, the empirical evidence is very strong for the Marx, Marx's law of profitability, as I call it. So, but this, that is the minority view. People like Michael Heinrich, David Harvey, you've mentioned, who is a, a very uh, uh, eminent scholar of Marx's work. Prominent, yeah. Uh, big, big YouTube follower, everybody follows in millions, not yeah. millions, but maybe there's no millions following Marxism, but uh, <laughs> big, big population follows for his works and his readings of Marx and so on, but he completely rejects the law of the tendency rate of all the four. He completely, he completely rejects a lot of things um, that are <laughs> in Capital One, uh, Capital Volume. Well, I think so. Yeah. For him, a crisis are caused by uh, imbalances in consumption or in financialization, right. that is the finance taking over and, mm -hmm. and so on. Uh, I don't think these alternative theories work. Uh, and I still think that Marx's classical explanation of theory of crises is convincing, as in volume three, and is empirically valid over the last 150 years. So it's both theoretically convincing, in my view, and empirically uh, supported by the evidence that many Marxists uh, in the last 50 years in particular have developed now that we get more and more data that, and we can analyze. Right. But that's a big debate amongst the uh, 10 people who claim to be Marxist economists. <laughs> uh, there's two of us taking this view and the other eight the other view. And we all get in a stagecoach every so often at academic conferences and have a big row about it again or write articles attacking each other. Uh, so I'd ask the readers and the viewers uh, that there's plenty of material to, for them to consider whether this, uh, which of the theories that are right. Yeah, absolutely. And it's uh, quite exciting to follow, at least from uh, my perspective. So let's then get in a little bit into the weeds. Um, we're already quite advanced in time, so let, let's mm -hmm. see how far we get. But let's at least talk about the three depressions. And you identified the third one as being the one that we are in right now. Um, let's talk about maybe the first two. How would you, from this Marxist perspective of the law of profitability, explain these two preceding historical depressions? What led to them? How did that happen? And um, let's leave it at that. So we have two depressions, the Long Depression in the late 19th century, and we have the Great Depression of the mid 20th century. Well, yeah, sorry. Now, if you think, uh, if you divide the time between, the, the, if you like, the beginnings of each of these three depressions that I've identified, you find 
that the difference in time is about 50 to 60 years. And now in the early 1920s, um, a Russian Bolshevik economist or socialist economist called Kondratiev mm -hmm. or analyzed the development of capitalism over this very long period of time, not the short periods that we're talking about with recessions. And he identified that there appeared to be, uh, if you like, a big long cycle. We now call it the Kondratiev cycle, those of who are sympathizing with this view, or a very big long wave of 56 years. So it goes up for, say, 25, 30 years, and then it goes down. What, is, what goes up and down? Production, uh, investment levels, and so on. So we can see a very long period. Uh, people have since tried to identify these uh, long periods of up and down, long waves, Kondratiev cycles, with changes in technological innovation, new clusters right. of innovations coming in, new technology, which drives this cycle up, and then these, these new technologies get exhausted and replaced after a while by a new cluster. So we have these very long waves. Now, in my book, The Long Depression, uh, I'm quite sympathetic to that view, but I think we can find a more uh, penetrating and compelling explanation of these long cycles based on profitability, based on the profit cycle, as I would call it. And I noticed, if, starting with the US and the Long Depression, but in other countries too, that within these long periods of 50 to 60 years, there are periods where there is a shorter periods of profit up waves and profitability down waves. So uh, let me give you an example in the 20th century. At the end of the Second World War, uh, profits profitability was very high in most of the major economies. It was a golden age for capitalism. They could invest hugely and make big profitability, and they can even pay their workers more and employ more because they're making high profits. This golden age came to an end when the law of profitability operated. And then from the mid 1960s to the early 80s, we had a, a fall in profitability, a significant fall. Eventually, a, the slump of the 1980s and the neoliberal period after saw a recovery in profitability more or less up to the end of the century. But at now, after the end of the uh, 20th century, going into the 21st century, we've been in a downturn again of about right. 20 years in profitability. So that covers the same period as the Kondratiev cycle, mm -hmm. but broken into four periods. You might call them the spring period of going up, the summer period then going down, then the autumn period of going up again, and finally the winter period of a very depressed drop to a new low before maybe capitalism has a new leaf of life, life for another 50 or 60 years, maybe. Uh, so in my view, we're in this winter period, which we can call the Long Depression. And each of the two other depressions are in those winter periods, that fourth quarter of this 50 to 60 years, approximately. It's right. Sure, sure, sure. Bit, but approximately, <clears throat> so my theory of the three depressions is that it's a result of the changes in the profitability of capital. And the last, uh, it has to be four periods on the whole, and they break down like that with the last period you might call the winter period being the end of that is where the depression is. The depression is dominated in that fourth uh, quarter of maybe uh, uh, 20 years. So depressions end up being about 18 to 20 years within the whole cycle of maybe 60 to 70 years. Uh, that's my theory which I present in the Long Depression. It's open to dispute, and I'm quite prepared to back down because it's difficult to judge whether that's right. But I, I, I think it has quite a convincing explanation of why we've only had three depressions, because we've only had, if you like, three winters in the last 150, 160 years. Uh, but what it does tell you, if you think about this view, is if we're in the winter phase in the long depression, is should it not come to an end at some point? And will there then be a new revival of capitalism, uh, starting with a rise in the spring and, and a higher profitability? I leave that question open for us to consider. Yeah. Um, if if the time certain, I mean, would be maybe like in 10 or 20 years, then we'll have another episode and I want to talk about whether we are now in spring or something like this, right? Yeah. Um, uh, what I find interesting about this whole profitability um, or looking at the profitability rate is exactly what you just described about uh, um, the neoliberal era, which normally, if you look in, onto left circles, is mainly described as like a as like a um, consequence of bad policy decisions. So basically, I mean, if you if you read David Harvey again and yeah. um, his history of, of neoliberalism, he mentions the 
the profitability crisis of the 70s. Um, but his focus is strongly on Mont Pelerin society and all these neo neoliberal think tanks and those groups that undermine the economy. And then all of this is empiric. I mean, historically, this is all true. They all existed and they all did the stuff that he's talking about. But if you divorce this reality from, from the falling rate of profit and, and the, the real crisis that especially the West was experiencing in this time, you, I, my, in my opinion, you cannot understand and you can also not combat um near liberalism or the, the the crisis that we are in um uh, right now so that's something that definitely um helps a lot so i, ha I had so many arguments with um let's say all yeah. the liberals in in germany about we just need to return to the 80s you know the policy yes. of the 80s um, i mean there, there is a uh, the way it's presented yeah. neoliberalism is like it's a change of ideas or a change of policy exactly. uh, yeah. The Keynesians, that's the people who said that Keynes got it all right in the 1930s and the post-war period. We had the period of so-called Keynesian macro management where we had full employment, welfare state, and so on. So Keynesianism worked. Uh, well, in my view, that the reason Keynesianism worked was simply because profitability was high yeah. and capitalists could afford it. As yeah. the profitability fell in the latter part of uh, through the 1970s, uh, why did capitalists Abol uh, get rid of a Keynesian policy. Why did government stop talking about Keynesian macro management, managing the economy? Because it wasn't working. Capitalism was in a profitable crisis. So then you get a change of ideas. The neoliberals, the free marketeers, the uh, people who want to just let the market run rip and have no regulation, if you like, their ideology was always there. There was always people arguing for that. Sure. But they were in a minority amongst the strategies of capital because they strategies of capital found that a high profitability economy in the golden age and Keynesian macro management appeared to work. But when it didn't work, then suddenly all the neoliberals came into prominence and we had politicians too who adopted these theories. So we got rid of sort of social democrats. And in the 1980s, we had Reagan, Thatcher, and all the more right-wing market-oriented uh, politicians who adopted the policies of privatization, crushing the trade unions, globalization, deregulating the economy, the policy of neoliberalism were necessary for capitalism. It was basically like a, a policy yeah. as a countervailing tendency. Um, exactly, the policy to impose, <clears throat> bring through the countervailing tendencies. And so <clears throat> viewers think about it. Do you think uh, things change merely because some people have one set of ideas, another people have another set of ideas, and then uh, the the majority goes to this idea as opposed to that idea, or some ideas are good and other ideas are bad. Under capitalism, all ideas are possible as long as the profitability of capital is increased, and that's what they're interested in. So the, the reason policies and ideas change from a welfare state, mixed economy, uh, people working together, was because it wasn't working for capitalism. Profitability collapsed, so they went back. They call it neoliberalism. They went back to what capitalism does most of the time, which is to try and crush workers, increase uh, profitability through various measures, reduce the government, reduce the welfare state. And that policy has still dominated even into the 21st century. Uh, we haven't returned to cap, uh, Keynesianism or macro management. So when Keynesians and others say to me, that's what we need to do, I hear books every week. What we need to do is get back to what we had in the 1960s right. and so on. The answer is not going to happen, viewers because it's not in the interests of capitalism to do it. That would drastically affect their profitability. They're not going to go down that road again. The golden age of the period of the 1950s and 1960s was an exception for capitalism. Neoliberalism is an exception. It's the norm. Uh, and that's the sort of economy that we're in now. So it's an illusion on the part of Keynesians to think that we can have some sort of reformed, uh, moderate capitalism that works for all. If it did work, and it only worked in advanced economies in the 1950s and 60s to some extent, never worked in the wider world, like you, you wrote, read Keynes, you'll read nothing about the third world or global south or the shocking global poverty around the world. Nothing's in Keynes about that. It was completely dominated and concentrated on the advanced capitalist economies. Now we're in a situation where three to four billion people in the, in the world out of nearly eight billion are in grotesque poverty, even by World Bank standards in poverty. Uh, so nothing has, has changed capitalism. That's normal capitalism. 
and it's horrific capitalism for the majority of the world's population. So are you saying that, for example, the last depression that started in 2008 and 2009, I'm being, I'm being um, sarcastic now, but uh, are you then saying that this was not actually due to a neoliberal hyper deregulation of the financial sector and that this was actually, you know, just some bankers and maybe, I don't know, Goldman Sachs that actually tanked the economy and, and, and caused that thing to happen? Well, that's that's a, uh, an explanation which is often presented to us by uh, people in the labor movement that uh, the problem was that bankers were deregulated and allowed to do what they want, uh, particularly from about uh, 2000 onwards. But actually earlier deregulation had taken place in the finance sector and the finance sector massively expanded and was completely out of control and eventually collapsed like a house of cards. Uh, this is obviously true. That is yeah did happen. There's no yeah. doubt about it. But why did financialization and this big financial sector suddenly grow massively? Why was investment made by capitalists into the financial sector rather than into the productive sector of increasing uh, technology? Of course, that was done to some extent, but increasing technology and in raising the, the amount of uh, output that people could enjoy. Why was a huge move by the capitalist profits into the financial sector? Because the profit, profitability of the productive sector, as we might call it in Marx's terms, the bit that produces things and services we actually need, was low, falling and was low. So therefore, the capitalists looked elsewhere for profit. So one of the counteracting factors to the profitability falling in the productive sector was a massive increase in trying to make profits in the financial sector. So deregulation took place. Yes, and eventually it came crashing down because the profitability in the productive sector remained low and the gap between the two sectors got such the point that it was the financial sector that collapsed because the, prof the productive sector was so weak. So uh, it's not because of bad policies or greedy bankers. Yes, all those things existed, but because sure. of the underlying process of the material conditions of capitalism, just like I described it with neoliberalism. Right, right. And, and so it's especially, sad i would say if leftists or you know um, marxists or communists adopt this view um because then ultimately what you're saying is that the problem is those greedy bankers and if you just had the you know i don't know the right laws or the right oversight then <clears throat> then capitalism is fixed basically and that's uh, not something that i think yeah that's Marx the that's correct. the policy conclusion if you think about it guys yeah. that um if we just give workers more wages uh uh, if the cause of crisis is workers' wages too low, why don't we just give workers low more wages and the crisis will be over? This is a sort of Keynesian solution. The answer to that, of course, if you give workers loads more wages, as workers are fighting for now, they're going to squeeze profits and then you'll get a slump. You know, the contradictions of capitalism cannot be resolved within capitalism. Uh, the only way to resolve the contradictions of capitalism, the battle between workers' wages and profits, between the falling profitability and so on, is by getting rid of capitalism, replacing capitalism, not trying to make it work, manage it and so on. But the majority of people, and not just the majority of uh, mainstream economists or activists, but also in the socialist and Marxist wing of the labor movement, is they're looking for a way to make capitalism work. Uh, because what's the alternative? A revolutionary yeah. transformation of capitalism is a frightening thing for many people. It could go badly wrong. And it, we know that it has gone badly wrong historically. In a yeah. way. So it's a frightening thing. But I, I have to tell you, viewers, that there will be no alternative. Capitalism is getting more and more difficult for it to survive, to grow, to meet the needs of the world's population. Climate change, viruses, uh, it, huge inequality, low productivity. They're not going to be resolved within the capitalist system over the next uh, generation, in my view. Uh, just a couple of words. Let's not go too deep into the weeds here, but because you were talking about um, Keynesians, how about the MMTers? Do you like? Do you think that there's something there that we can, you know? I mean, because ultimately, I see the same there as what you just described, which is the, the basically the idea to step in and do what capitalism can do, which is, I don't know, um, fund projects like the Green New Deal. Um, because they are not interested, interesting for capital because they're not profitable and, but the state can step in because he can just, the state can just print the money basically. Um, is, is that not a solution that we could look at? 
Well, first let me say, I think if we want a new deal, which is a phrase referring to Roosevelt's new deal of the 1930s, yeah. which actually didn't work in getting people's jobs back. Uh, but leaving that aside, that's an historical discussion. Uh, if we want a deal if, but which will deliver full employment, improve the conditions and deal with climate change and global warming, uh, reduce inequality, create the conditions where global poverty no longer exists, then we need a massive investment by governments and states in cooperation around the world. Now, modern monetary, which is really a version of Keynesianism, it's saying if governments spend more money, they'll boost demand, workers will get more mo uh, money in their pockets, and then more spending will produce a better economy. We don't have to do anything with the structure of the economy. We don't have to get rid of Amazon. We don't have to get rid of Netflix. We don't have to take public ownership of the pharma pharmaceuticals companies. All we have to do, the government, all it has to do is spend money and get the central bank to print it, print it. When I mention the word print it to MMT people, when I debated with them, they get really upset. Oh, you're so old fashioned, Michael. Nobody prints money anymore. Yeah, we now, just of course click, I know they just don't click print them. it anymore. <laughs> they just all the central bank does is it adds credit to the uh, banking system's uh, deposits and accounts. I know it's digital, but they they insist on making this as an interesting argument, which it isn't. The main point is that by injecting huge amounts of money or credit into the system, they don't actually solve the structure of the capitalist system, and it doesn't actually produce the result because. If profitability is falling, it doesn't matter how much money you pump in. All the capitalists will do is hoard it uh, or put it into the financial sector to, um, and spend on stocks and shares. It won't deliver what the MMT people say. Marx said he had a debate with or a number of debates with a similar uh, view from Joseph Proudhon in the middle of the 19th century, mm -hmm. who argued that well, we can solve capitalism by just printing enough money. Sorry, it was printing then. Uh, in, in order to create enough credit so that we can set up cooperatives and, the, and the, we can have a sort of socialism within capitalism. Marx says this is ridiculous. Unless you change the structure of the capitalist process of production, end production for profit, investment for profit, then you, doesn't, the, the money uh, is not going to be a solution. It's a money trick. You're just coming up with a trick of money. You're not actually solving the real problem. And that's the same issue with MNT, in my view. Yeah, and I would even go further and say that even if M T, if M T was right, and we could, you know, um, and I think, I mean, there is argument to say, yeah, they are technically right that the central bank yeah. can print that money, government can then spend the money, um, but they if this money, that. where if this money actually were to have the effect that that uh, left MMTers at least propagate, which yeah. is, for example, help the working class um, create, create I don't know, a stable income for them, like a, a job guarantee or some, something like that, you would actually attack power this way, yeah. um, attack capitalist power. And um, now, now the question becomes, why would they go along with that? And, and then there, that, that's also usually where MMT stops and then always throws their hands up and says, oh, but we are not, we are not, writing any policy we're just doing that theory um well they well, say yes they say this is how it this is how it is as yeah. though it doesn't have any effect but the other argument the more left-wing ones and i've debated with bill mitchell who's an australian supporter of founder of modern monetary theory who said to me no that's not true i'm a socialist too uh, right. i think we should right. take over amazon we should have a state uh, a democratic economy uh, which works for people's needs uh but IMT is different. We're just talking about how we should get the government, uh, enable the government to spend more. Okay, uh, fair enough. <laughs> but, and I say to that, well, yes, but as you've exactly said, Nadi, if you really have a radical spending program, you're going to create the contradiction that capitalism will come up against you really hard. So why don't we just advocate taking over the capitalist system rather than thinking of little tricks on the money front uh, to solve the issue within capitalism? There is a contradiction between their positions like two stages or two separate departments yes i'm a socialist but also all i want to do now is government spending funded by money the two things must be connected and one yeah. won't without the other yeah i mean if, if the if, if the first mmt or that comes my way and says that he wants to abolish wants to abolish the commodity form and the uh, value form and he wants to ab abolish class and he wants to um, uh, 
uh, uh, you know, overthrow the capitalist system with MMT, I'll be listening. But until then, it's like, <laughs> maybe not. No, but I'm listening anytime. Yeah. Um, but it okay. is, it's an attempt to look at an alternative rock short of replacing yes. the capitalist system. That's, yes. that's its danger. That you yes. should not be confused. Whatever is right about, we don't want austerity. We don't want cuts in government spending and welfare. And yes. so on. We don't want increased taxation. But if we're just going to put forward the idea that we can print money, sorry to use that phrase again, in order to spend enough to, to meet those things, we're looking with misleading ourselves because it's not going to work while the cap is control the means of production and right. only invest for profit. Right. One, maybe a couple of last words. I have a couple of spare questions. Maybe one of them is interesting if we have a little bit of time, but we'll check this after the, your next answer. Um, a couple of words on the current crisis, and I don't mean the, the, the depression, which we are still in, I mean the, the COVID crisis mm -hmm. and the slump of 2020, which resulted in an uptick in 2021 and now in this kind of you know panic on inflation and what's happening with the prices and what's going to happen next year. Um, first, do you, do you think, you actually already said that, you think that we are still in a long depression? And actually, the long depression will reassert itself. We will see that again in, in both inflation and profitability rates. Uh, what can we expect what, what in, in your projections, let's say? What can we expect in the coming years, maybe in this year, maybe in the next year? Um, will profitability be restored soon? How soon do you think? And how does the maybe looking a little bit lo longer term, but actually not so longer term, how does the whole climate change um, uh, or a climate catastrophe actually that's coming um, yeah. play into all this? Well, um, when the uh, COVID uh, slump came, I wasn't quite sure what would have come out of that. I thought about this. Uh, will this slump be so bad that capitalism actually, or whoever's left, will be able to uh, take advantage of higher profitability and we can have a bit of a boom? Uh, but I've concluded that after a year of 2021, that's not going to happen. And the reason it's not going to happen is, first of all, that if you think about it, all the weak companies, all the nearly unprofitable companies uh, that can hardly service their own debts, we call them zombie companies, right. in medical circles, they're still there. The right. central banks uh, have financed them, kept them going. The government has provided monies for all companies to survive to varying degrees. The bigger ones got more. Uh, but uh, so no, there's been no liquidation of the weak parts of the capitalist system. So that means that the profitability has stayed low because the weak ones haven't been wiped out. In fact, that's one of the features of the long depression since the Great Recession in 2008-9. Unlike the Great Depression of the 1930s, when lots of liquidation took place, a lot of companies went out of business. Capitalists have avoided, well, governments have avoided this. They've got central banks to pump money into the banks so that they survived. Uh, and then we're now seeing they pump them into the co into companies directly in order to make them survive during the uh, COVID slump. So profitability remains low. And I don't see that any huge fiscal spending, that's government spending to boost the economy in general, is coming through from any country in particular. On the contrary, the fiscal spending to for people's wages and paychecks and, and companies and being sent home and so on has come to an end. Mm. And that while that has produced a bit of a sugar rush, as I call it, a burst of energy and production as, as companies open up again and start up again, that there is no, that the, te the governments are not going to spend any extra money. They're cutting it back. They will be cutting it back. Profitability remains low. Debt is way higher than it was before the COVID right. slump. Right. And at the same time, we have no real boost coming from the government sector, Keynesian style, to help uh, people or the or companies. And that's particularly the case in the in the global south. I'd like to mention the viewers: don't forget the rest of the world. Yeah, it's much bigger in population than than we are here in Europe. And these people are on the barest minimum of wages, and they're really suffered under the slump. And there's no prospect of them coming out. Quite the contrary. Many government uh, governments are facing bankruptcy as a result of the increased debt. We could see some this year defaulting on their international debt as a result. So the situation right. hasn't improved. So I don't think we're going to have a burst of life for capitalism coming out of this. Some people claim, the mainstream economists claim, it's going to be like the roaring 20s. 
uh, of the 20, of 1920s, when after the Spanish flu epidemic, similar to COVID, came to an end in 1920-21, there was a boom, at least in the United States, for six, seven, eight years before the stock market crash of 1929. And some people are saying, well, this is what we're going to have now. I don't see any evidence of that. Uh, and therefore, capitalism remains in this uh, grueling depressionary state for the for the possibly the rest of this decade. Uh, the only way it's going to be resolved, and perhaps it answers the next question, is that if there's a major slump that really does liquidate a load of bad weak companies, so, so it has to go further down. Basically, there has to be something yes, catastrophic. I think we need another major. Mm -hmm. Can you believe that, viewers? That you're, after what we've been through in the, in the 21st century so far, the Great Recession, the COVID, yeah. stuff, we need another one for capitalism to have any prospect of coming out. Uh, uh, and beginning to revive in any way. Uh, and that maybe that will happen by the end of this particular decade. But that's the prospect. That's the only alternative. Otherwise, we grind on uh, forever. And as you said, Nadine, capitalism faces huge problems now. It's right. not just um, low productivity, huge inequalities, which makes it difficult for, to keep uh, popular protest down uh, and raises the whole question of what this system is for if it doesn't deliver for everybody. And as you say, climate change, an existential uh, problem for capitalism, for everybody, that capitalism is actually driving us towards to annihilation, not only maybe of the human race or large numbers of the population being flooded or in heat and so on, but also species being wiped out, ecology being wiped out on the planet. That's a prospect by the middle of this 21st century, unless something is seriously done. And nothing really is being seriously done. So capitalism is not offering us a way out of that disaster. And don't forget, viewers, we've had a huge pandemic over a COVID or coronavirus or a series of variants. There's no reason to not to expect we'll have other pandemics because the drive of capitalism into areas of the world where these pathogens have been living for thousands of years in various animals in remote areas is now opening up a a wave of pandemics into humanity through the uh, economic system. So there's a, that's a huge problem. Uh, so if if we are around by the end of this particular century, the 21st century, which I won't be, I'm not sure Nadim will be, but uh, maybe our grandchildren will be, uh, that what will be the situation if, uh, if capitalism yeah. doesn't solve these problems or we don't change capitalism and introduce a new system which works towards on a world scale, works towards the social need of the uh, population of the world. Yeah, I must say this this consequence that you just um, laid out, the idea that uh, before profitability can be restored in our current current um, depression, there has to be more destruction of capital, more um, depression, <laughs> uh, yeah, or more devaluation of, of more devaluation of, exactly of, of capital values or profit. For the, that, that, the rest can survive. It's it's not a very nice theory, is it? Um, it's quite we, unsettling. Yeah. <laughs> we would like a much more hopeful Keynesian theory. Uh, that all we have to do is get the government to spend a bit more, and problems will right. be solved. Only get rid of bad politicians and bad ideas, and get some new good ideas in. Uh, but I also, also that conditions that, don't make that possible unless we nope. change the system completely. No, nope, I don't think so. And I mean, ultimately, that also. Um, gives us an idea if I mean if we go to the last depression and we look at what restored capital profitability yeah. back then it was a humongous world war and the fact that one of the biggest economies or the biggest economy of of that time survived that war without any any capital destroyed on its own um, territory yeah. and and could basically rebuild capitalism throughout the world or in Europe at least and that restored profitability um, but Ted Rees, I listened to a podcast with Ted Rees recently, yeah. who was a who was a Grossman um, student, and wow. he said something that um, uh, scared me mm, a lot. He, and he said, like the, the dimensions, the, the sheer dimensions of capitalism, like the idea that capitalism now is just bigger, all encompassing, seeing all over the uh, seen all over the world, and having a much higher productivity. The amount of capital that would have to be destroyed. If we compare that in relation to the amount of capital that was destroyed in yeah. the Second World War, that's like it's unfathomable what yeah. will have to happen. And and, and he's one of those um, Grossmanites that talks about that 
um, terminal crisis and yeah. thinks that this is coming. And this is the thing that I would like to close with, if it's yeah. okay for you. Uh, do you are you still okay? I'd like to have two or three sure. more minutes? Sure. Yeah. Because um, I mean, I'm, I'm saying Grossman, Heinrich Grossman was like this great Marxist thinker um, that also only recently, I think, got really um, translated into English um, or is still being translated. Yeah. In, in some of his works and new germans the luckier i think yeah in in in, in germany we have him yeah exactly yeah. We, we can read him and and he has been uh, talking exactly about this um yeah. profitability law and, and doing a lot of economics with that i think maybe the most sophisticated that we had for a long long time and i mean if you look at what he's saying the logical conclusion also even if you only look at the at the argument of that marx brings the logical conclusion is if the tendency goes down and at some point it will ha hit the x axis right <laughs> um so i i mean I, I don't fully understand from your book that you're um, you 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 subscribe to this view but it's of course a very interesting question does the tendency of the rate of profit to fall or the law of the tendency of the rate of profit to fall conclude in a terminal crisis and uh are we maybe already in that one or will there be another cycle before we reach it well um bolshevik leader lenin once said that there is no permanent crisis in right. capitalism capitalism will find its a way out of every crisis well and what grossman was really saying was that each that there is crises on a regular recurring basis his book is uh, uh, called uh, the theory of breakdown and also a theory of crisis and when you use the word breakdown, he said, look, capitalism's heading towards doom because of this pressure, downward pressure on profitability. But it will find ways out of it as we go. And each time there's a slump, there's a new way out. But it's pretty difficult for capitalism to, to have a new wave of growth and expansion in the world. As you pointed out, it's everywhere now. There's less workers to exploit that haven't already been exploited. And the level of capital investment is so great that it's very difficult for profitability to be increased without a massive slump or series of slumps. But it's still possible that, that could happen and new technologies could take place to, to drive up uh, profitability again and productivity. Uh, on the mathematical question, uh, I get this argument quite often. Uh, David Harvey recently was on a YouTube seminar like this and he made a joke, oh, Michael Roberts, he's always going on about the rate of profit falling. I, I haven't heard, Is it, has it reached zero yet, Michael? <laughs> Uh, uh, and uh, uh, that demonstrates well. It might. Dem it's, I thought it was quite a good joke, uh, but it, it's not taking the uh, the theory or the, the law very seriously. Because what we've just discussed is yes, there's a tendency for the profitability to be going down, and I suppose theoretically you could say we go to zero uh, eventually, and capitalism will collapse of its own accord. But actually, what happens is that. We have counteracting factors, which we just discussed. So there are periods when the rate of profit rises again. And we have slumps, which drives the profitability up again. So it's a bit like being on a ship heading towards the horizon. We're going to get to the horizon, but we never actually get there because the horizon keeps moving further away. And if you like it mathematically, uh, depending on which country you're using, if you want to take the US or the world rate of profit, which one Argentine Marxist economist developed, he worked out that if we take all that into account, as of now, we will get to zero in 2065. Uh, That's my but, tour, right? Yeah. But yeah. then he said, of course, if we have slumps in between, then the horizon right. goes further back. And right. so you, it will always keep going back. We're never going to get to zero before capitalism uh, contradictions reach such a, a level that the climate change disaster will happen well before that. Uh, right, right. And, and all these other factors will come in. So uh, it, it's... Grossman is right. There is a breakdown of capitalism, and, but there are crises, and the, the breakdown is the tendencies that are going on and the counter tendencies mm -hmm. which exist, and mm -hmm. they are resolved by a series of slumps. So basically, it says theoretically, there is, I mean, it, there, there should be some kind of point zero where we reach that x axis but as this as this can move out uh, by the countervailing tendencies and it can be pushed out more and more um we do not know whether it's in 20 years or whether it's in 250 years um no. and uh, some of these countervailing tendencies like the destruction of capital can be quite catastrophic um and, and can reset a lot of the stuff that has been happening and then then the, the tendency reasserts itself but from a much higher level 
Yeah. And, and, and that, zero. actually, in my view, that's actually helpful to the labor movement in some ways. This may sound strange, but when you're in a depressed environment where people haven't got any incomes, where they're working long hours, where they're not in a position to struggle very easily, where trade unions have been crushed, as they have been in the last uh, period, uh, then what you need is a, a new confidence in the labor movement, which means strength. The labor movement feels strong. It, does, it can't be sacked. It can't be crushed. It's got tra organized trade unions, which happened in the 50s and 60s. Right. And that meant that when the profitability crisis came in the 1970s, there was a massive class struggle in the advanced capitalist countries and in the colonial countries. Uh, as capitalists tried to uh, get their profits back up, they weren't prepared to make concessions. Workers still felt strong. And so you had a big struggle. We know what happened in the 1970s, although the worker struggles were eventually defeated by a combination of slumps, uh, mistakes or breakdowns by their leaders and so on uh what we need is a period like that again where right. in a way capitalist profit is up a bit but now it's becoming more difficult and workers feel stronger i don't think we're in that situation yet the winter the long depression mm. it's not a very good one yes. uh, hopefully that will have dis that will have a change in the next decade or so well, the fact that we are talking on a, on a program like this about this law and the fact that I think I'm also quite convinced about it and I think I agree with you, I think from an um, organizational perspective, it also has this, um, this unique uh, idea that we cannot reform the system or tweak the system in some way, but that we actually need to have a revolutionary doesn't mean violently, but you know, a revolutionary out, outlook that actually wants to replace capitalism or, or um, let's say, uh, move ahead of capitalism. Or um, I forgot the word in English now. Well, there's lots of versions. There's moving around capitalism, post capitalism. <laughs> I prefer, it's a, I'm a bit old fashioned. Transcend, transcend capitalism. That's yeah. what I want to say. I prefer socialism. I'm a bit old fashioned, really. Exactly. Uh, socialism. That seems a fairly good word to be using of the sort yes. of system that we want to replace yes. this one with. Michael, um, this was so great. I really, really enjoyed the talk. Thank you for giving us so much time. It's one hour, 20 minutes. I'm sorry, it's a bit more than uh, we... I hope talked. the viewers haven't fallen asleep and uh, it's useful to... No, we get, we get quite some good feedback here. I think um, everyone enjoyed this. Our English, um, we have a little English community and that's why we try to do English episodes like once a month. Okay. Um, but of course, it's a little bit smaller than our um, our German viewers. Yeah. But we are also working slowly, but we are slowly but surely working on creating those subtitles. So we hope that um, you, yeah. know, you will also be available to read at least for them soon. Um, Michael, we have to do this again. Maybe not talk about the book, but maybe talk about something current. Maybe sure. we can get you on the show one more time. Um, but until then, I hope you have a good time. Stay uh, safe. Stay healthy. And thanks again for everything. And thank you, great viewers and Nadine. Um, please don't don't run away immediately. I'm going to throw on the outro. And uh, after the outro, I'm going to have another word with you just a second. OK? OK. OK. Then uh, to everyone in the chat and everybody who is here, thanks for watching and thanks for the comments. Have a nice evening and see you soon. Wir brauchen eure Hilfe und zwar als allererstes folgt uns bitte überall, wo ihr uns folgen könnt. Wir sind auf YouTube, auf Facebook, auf Twitter. Wir sind jetzt mittlerweile auch auf Twitch. Gebt uns Instagram. Dort, äh, Instagram sowieso, genau. Gebt uns dort einen Follow. Äh, liked dieses Video bitte. Überhaupt jedes Video, das ihr euch anschaut, bitte liken. Warum nicht? Ist doch einfach nur ein Klick da. Damit helft ihr uns ungemein. Wenn ihr uns abonniert auf YouTube, klickt auch die Glocke. Dann werdet ihr immer informiert, wenn wir live gehen. Dann könnt ihr dazukommen. Äh, je mehr Leute live mit uns unterwegs sind, desto äh, besser sind dann auch die Views und desto besser ist das für den Algorithmus. Wir haben außerdem ein Patreon-Konto. Genau. Patreon.com slash 99 zu 1. Wenn ihr so richtig dabei sein wollt, könnt ihr euch Membership-Level aussuchen. Wir haben drei verschiedene Stufen. Es gibt dann solche Sachen wie zum Beispiel diese neuen Nachspiel-Episoden, wo wir jetzt die erste gemacht haben. Und ihr habt auch Zugang zu unserer Discord-Community. Weiters haben wir einen paypal.me slash 99 zu 1 Link, falls ihr denkt, naja, sind schon schnaffte Typen, aber mehr als einmal will ich nicht zahlen, dann könnt ihr uns da auch ein bisschen Geld schicken. Wir haben tatsächlich inzwischen relativ signifikante laufende Kosten, weil wir einen hohen Qualitätsanspruch haben. Insofern wir sind wir wirklich auf eure Unterstützung angewiesen. 